I love coming to church. I love coming to church when you know and understand that the Spirit of God is going to be present. I would not want to come in here week after week, month after month, year after year, and it just be hollow words and a lifeless atmosphere. But when he comes, when he comes, he makes up all of the difference. And for that, we say praise his precious name. We're kicking off a new series um, today entitled uh, Unshaken and Unashamed. Unshaken and Unashamed. Two different subjects. Two different subjects. And we want to try to cover those in this series today. Maybe you've never heard much about the title of today's message, but I want to look today at why a worldview matters. Why a worldview matters. And you might say, well, pastor, I've been raised in a Christian home and, and I understand a little bit about the Bible and, and, and I, I, I know a few things. But here's the deal. We have so much influence from the outside world pounding the church, pounding the Christian, trying to infiltrate things into our minds and our way of thinking and our way of living, that if we don't have ourselves established in what I'm calling a world view, a world view that is connected with the word of God, we're going to be in trouble. And so basically the summary of what I'm going to talk about today, and I'll probably be repeating this line a couple different times. And what you believe about God's word will determine how you view the world around you. If your worldview does not come from God's word, it will come from the world. If your worldview does not come from God's word, it will come from from the world. And the word world, translating that and making the meaning of that, um, the, the um, atmosphere of what we're living in. The atmosphere of what we're living in. Now, I'm not going to ask the question because I can see many of you. I can see all of you, matter of fact. And I see some of you are wearing glasses and maybe as many people are wearing contacts. And we have a, uh, an eye doctor in our midst today, and he has seen hundreds and thousands of people. He has probably seen many of you more than once. And I know that when I first started going to Dr. Winbigler, and, um, you know, he's, he's first class, he's, he's the best of the best, and um, I, don't, I, think, I don't think there's anybody as good as him around, at least these parts, and so therefore... I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience with him. I was wearing glasses prior to going to him several years ago, but I thought, you know, I want to change over and start wearing contacts. <clears throat> and, of course, he's going to say, we can try it. <laughs> and so um, we got the contacts. Now, I have, I have two great boys. Um, and Michael, who's been around the area longer than Todd has, if you don't know Michael, just in case, he has, he has opinions. <clears throat> His last name is Hurls, and he has opinions. So he, he voiced his opinion to me regarding the fact that I was getting contacts or attempting to get contacts. Dad, Dad, you'll never wear them. Dad, you'll never get used to them. I said, well, I, I got them from Dr. Windbigger. He said, that doesn't matter. <laughs> But we have glasses and we have contacts because according to what we all know, if we have any questions about it, we can ask Doc, we're supposed to have 20-20 vision. And however we get there, you know, we'll take those steps to get there. And I think probably right now, I think with my glasses on, I think I'm 20-20, okay? And I'm not too far off with my glasses off. But anyway, so we're going to wear them just to make sure. But we want 20-20 vision. We want clear vision. We want to be able to see correctly the things that we look upon every single day. You know, um, people put on different color of glasses 
as I could illustrate them. You know, some people put on uh, the red glasses that represent Republican. And some people put on the blue that represent the Democrat. You know, and then some people put on uh, red um, for Ohio State. And some people put on brown for the Bears or the Bengals or, or the Browns. Excuse me. Boy, I got that one. Boy, that wasn't in my notes, Jeff. Jeff just sitting back there just shaking his head. He'll see me after church. But the basic level, low level, the bottom level, is, this is true. A worldview is the lens through which we see, we define, and we make judgments about the world around us. It's the framework from which we view reality and make sense of reality. Jeff Myers, a president of Summit Ministries, defined worldview as this. A pattern of ideas, beliefs, convictions, and habits that help us make sense of God, the world, and our relationship to God and the world. I like that definition. And that's why I put his name with it. Jeff Myers gave that correct definition. Now, there was a yard sign in a person's yard, and this kind of tagged their worldview. This is what it said. We believe science is real. Women's rights are human rights. Black lives matter. No person is illegal. Love is love. Diversity makes us stronger. And that was their definition, pretty much, of their worldview. In our present cultural environment today, it's imperative that followers of Jesus Christ, that we're convictional, that we're courageous, and we're compassionate regarding our worldview. We must know what we believe, why we believe it, and how we can, and how we can, can communicate that to others. And we must be unshaken in our faith and unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, that wasn't my benediction, and that wasn't even all of my intro. Let me go on. Our main point today is this. What we believe about God's word will determine how we view the world around us. If your worldview does not come from God's word, it will come from the world. And you said, you just read that a little bit ago. But everybody didn't know I just read that. Some of you just, just heard it for the first time. And I'll probably read it a couple more times before I close out. Sadly, according to George Barna, the percentage of those with a biblical worldview has been declining in each successive generation. Boomers, the decline has been 10%. The Gen X, 7%. Millennials, 6%. And the Gen Z, only 4% believe in the biblical worldview. Barna summarizes these findings as frightening in his article in the Christian Post. Biblical worldview must, uh, um, must, is much closer to extinct than ever before. And then he continues. He said that it gets worse. According to the American Worldview Inventory, he said, there are some alarming trends taking place today. The share of our population which claims to hold a biblical worldview fell from 6% to 4% in the last three years. And the last on this, but not least. The share of born-again believers who say they are deeply committed to practicing their faith, it fell from 85% to 50%. Simply put, our worldview it affects our realities, it affects our beliefs, our values, and it affects our behavior. Our worldview establishes what we believe to be real. Our beliefs establish what we believe to be true. Our values determine what we believe to be good. And our behavior influences what we do. This is important because we need to understand where we came from. Who am I? 
What is my purpose? How should I live? And what happens to me when I die? Apologist Frank Truex said this. He said, most people are not on the gospel truth. And most people are not on the gospel quest. He said, they're on the happiness quest. Whatever is going to make them happy, they're going to believe that. So, are we on the gospel quest or are we on the happy quest? If you have your sermon section and on the screen we have the scripture for today, a very familiar scripture in Romans chapter 12. Verses 1 and 2, I'm reading from the NIV. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to view of God's word, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So, how does this verse line up with helping us to understand how to have a good worldview? I think there are at least seven ways that we can develop a worldview, and I'm going to take them from these two verses. And I promise you, we will be out of here way before you think so. <clears throat> Number one, we need to respond. We need to respond to God's urgent appeal, Paul says. Now, he ends up chapter 11, a powerful, powerful chapter. The, dox, the, the doxology of, of that chapter was great and important. And then he comes in chapter 12, he said, and I appeal, I appeal to you, or I urge you, as some uh, translations might have it. He's talking about an appeal or a, he said, I'm urging you. Even though he could have said, I'm commanding you, he just says, I'm going to make an appeal to you. I'm going to encourage you. I want you to invite you. I want to beseech you. I think the King James says. The Amplified Bible renders it this. I beg of you. We are being asked to make a decision of our will. That's point number one. That was pretty quick, wasn't it? Number two, allow your beliefs to flow from, <clears throat> excuse me, allow your behaviors to flow from your beliefs. And here's what he says. Therefore, brothers. Now, whenever you see a word therefore, you ask yourself the question, why is it therefore? So we've got to go back and we can read all the things he said. My, there's 11 other chapters. And if we would take some, some really probably two years and go through the book of Romans, it would be incredible. But, but he, he's saying, therefore, in view of what I've already said to you, brothers and sisters, he's talking about allowing our behaviors to flow from our beliefs. Whenever you see the word therefore, you've got to ask yourself, why is it therefore? So Paul makes it a shift from chapter, chapter 11 He's making a shift um, uh, by, uh, by moving now to, to creed, from, from, from creed to conduct. He's moving now from principles to practice. And he's moving now from the expository part of his writing to the exhortation, from belief to behavior, and from doctrine to duty. He's moving now in this next chapter, chapter 12. Um, and also, don't forget this, the word doctrine, the word doctrine, the first two letters of that word is do, okay? So anyway, the doctrine and the duty go hand in hand. So Paul is telling us here we need to understand what we're practicing because what we believe will influence our behavior. And those, those that are believing the lies that are given to us from our society, every single day you are being fed lies, from all kinds of different advertisements. For these people that, that, you know, have these infomercials and they just suck you in and you say, oh, I've got to have that. I know it's going to help my earlobe. I know it's going to make it feel much better. <clears throat> that went over their head. Okay, that's okay. 
Now, I'm not going to call them liars. But we could all go through and get all the same product. Why don't we do that sometime? Let's just agree to one product that we heard advertised. Let's all get it and see if it works. We are being fed untruths all across the board with our society. So we must understand this, that we must have a practical application to what God is saying to us. And and it must be based and positioned on the person, Jesus Christ. Number three, be motivated by God's mercies. I love this phrase here, by the mercies of God. Now, it's the mercies, not just one mercy. And we know God has many, many, many mercies. And in, first, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3, it says that God is called the Father of mercies, plural, not just one. Again and again, he is merciful. Again and again, he is merciful. We see it five different times in, in, in Romans in chapter 9 and four times here in, in chapter 11. All the various times he uses the word mercies. Let me just read what John Calvin said regarding this right here. We will never worship with a sincere heart or serve God with an unbridled zeal until we properly understand how much we are indebted to God's mercy. God has demonstrated so much mercy to us. We can't help but respond by fully surrendering our lives to him. Isaac Watts captured it well when he wrote the song, Love so amazing, so divine, it demands my soul, my life, my awe. The mercies of God, they're new and they're great and they're plenteous. Number four, he says, offer your bodies on God's altar, okay, to present your bodies as a living Sacrifice. Now let's back up and go to the Old Testament just for a little bit, okay? This word uh, is, is to, to present, is, it's a technical term which is used to describe the offering of an animal for sacrifice back in the Old Testament. A live animal was brought in to the priest and it was placed on the owner's altar and, and the owner placed his hands on it and it was placed on the altar. And then the blood was came out. So that was a sacrifice that was offered to God. Now, in the New Testament, it's talking about a living sacrifice, which was much different than the, the sacrifices of animals, although they were alive. But now as we look at the word, at the word sacrifice, the living sacrifice, and it, we're talking about how God wants us to present our bodies to him. We are exhorted to offer our total being to him, not just bits and pieces. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 20, it says this, we are, for you were bought with a price, so therefore glorify God with your body. Glorify God with your body. So I think we could go, I could stay here for a long time. What people are doing to their bodies today is horrible. Not just today, 50 years ago, many years ago, all through the generations of mankind, the things that we and people have done to their bodies that have not been offering to God their bodies as a, as to, for the glory of God. So the word body here refers to a totality of our entire being. You say, well, how does that make sense? Um, our inter- our, it talks about our entire life and our activities. You know, the scripture says, and, and Paul says in the New Testament, um, for whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. In other words, if it's something that God would be ashamed of you doing or something that you would be ashamed to really announce to God, even though he knows you're doing it, um, for whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. So he may be worshiped and so he may be praised. So offering our entire body, our soul, our activities, our entire being. There was a pig and a chicken. They were walking down the road together when they came on a advertising a breakfast fundraiser. Many of you have heard this probably. 
The chicken said to the pig, we should donate to that worthy cause. Then he continued, how about if I give an egg and you provide the ham? (laughs) To which the pig replied, not so fast, buddy boy. You think that's a contribution, but for me, it's a total commitment. (laughs) And how many times do we just want to make a contribution to God and kind of pat ourselves on the back and kind of strut in our own spirit and say, boy, you know, and it's just a contribution. A contribution is not what God wants. He wants our full commitment. He wants our full commitment. And he always has. And he always will. So let's understand the difference um, from the conversation of uh, the pig and the chicken. Wow. Mercy. Number five. Resist conforming to the world. Verse one calls to a a decisive commitment and full surrender. Now we're moving to verse two. It's how that we maintain that commitment by, by renewing our mind And not following the fashions of the world. I'm going to describe that here. The schemes. That word conform. uh, Where we get the word scheme. Or there's another word. The word fashion. Fashion. And some of you say, well, you know, I've heard pastors and preachers talk about this verse time and time again. And I never have completely fully understand it. Well, I'm glad you're here today. I want to help you with the help of God. Okay. We are in the world. And I talked about this a few weeks ago as, as, as John was writing there in his prayer, um, the, uh, the 17th chapter of, of John. You know, we are in the world, but we're not to be of the world. You say, oh, Pastor, that just sounds good. But what does that really, really mean? We're talking about the patterns and the influences of our age. That's what this is talking about here. We're not to let the influences of the world Cause us to develop our worldview. That's what's happening in so many cases. It's happening to people and they don't, it's almost like they don't even know it's happening. It's happening so subtly and so gradually and they're so far away from what really they heard and understood just a few short years ago. So as we look at this word fashioned, we have, you know, the world system is really what it's talking about. And it was, I think, the Phillips translation that said, don't, don't, let, don't let the patterns of the world squeeze you, believers. Don't let it just squeeze you into its mold. And now, here we were. We were standing apart over here as believers and child followers, Christ followers. But the influence of the world bombarding us and slamming us and hitting us and in our face every single day. And, and what happened? We find ourselves just teeny, just teeny bit, just a little, just a little bit, just moving just a little bit. And then we begin to rationalize and justify. Well, it's not that bad after all. This verse says, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. And that's what's happening in America today. And it's infiltrating our churches. Let's not let that happen at life point. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank the Lord. And thank you for that hearty amen. So here we are. We need to be those people that are influencing the world. And not them influencing us. Number six. Receive the transformation from the word. The negative command calls us not to conform. The positive command tells us to be transformed. That's a nice word, isn't it? To be transformed. You've seen people that take a, have a project, whether it be a bicycle or, or a car or a house or whatever, and they just work. And man, they transform it. Wow. Look at that. I can't believe it. What'd you do? You transformed it. That's nothing compared to us being transformed by the Holy Spirit, by the renewing of our mind. He's referring to the interchange. 
Wow. I could say more there. I think that I'm, I'm going to leave it right there because I got a lot more going on here. I think, is there only seven on your sheet? Yeah, I got 16. <laughs> no, 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 I don't. No, I don't. Number seven. Adjust your will to God's will. How many times do we try to help God out? Huh? I have found, there's been times in my life I've tried to help God out. I'm going through a situation and I say, hey God, come here. We need to have a little talk. You kind of know where I'm at. I know kind of things messed up here a little bit, but I tell you what, I, I really think the easiest way out of this thing for me, and I'm sure you'll agree with me, God. We try to help God out so many times. I think God has a great sense of humor. And it could be something like this. He could maybe say, let me tell you. Let me tell you. So here it is right here. This, not only do we need to receive the transformation from, 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 from the word, but we need to adjust our will to God's will. Back in verse 2. That by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, the good and the perfect and the acceptable will of God. Okay. Until we offer our bodies, our minds, and our wills, we will not understand his good, his pleasing, and his perfect will. And you won't have a godly world view. So, it's like setting somebody down in the middle of an organization and they don't have a clue how this organization functions, but yet you're putting them here in the middle of it and you're expecting them to understand everything that leads up to their job and all the things that are going to go uh, after their job. And they're, you're just going to set them in there. They, don't under, they, they have no clue. And we have no clue what God's will is until we allow him to work on us, until we submit, until we commit, until we come to a point in our life and say, okay, God, you know what? It's me and you, and I want you to be my boss. I want you to be my guide. I want you to be my friend. I want you to be my helper. Folks, all these years I've served God and, and by, by, by no stretch of the imagination, I have had, I've fallen and I've failed and, 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 and you know, but I'm going to promise you, God has not one time failed. And there's been times I could take him back to his word or whoop, or there's times he could take me back to his word and say, hey, Rich, right here. Oh, yeah, that's right. I didn't have it right. And we can get all messed up. Sometimes our priorities are all messed up. Sometimes, you know, we can have a big heart and a good heart and all that. But, you know, God wants us just to, just, just to submit to his will. Just submit to his will. We can do that, and we can do it with his approval and with his blessing. So the Bible gives us all the answers we need. Let's go back to what I talked about earlier. Except I'm going to give you the answers this time. Where do I come from? We are created by God. Who are we? God made us in his image, both male and female. Number three, what is our purpose? God created us to know and follow him as he will, as, as we fill the earth over what he has for us and being good stewards for his glory. He wants us to align ourselves with his plan and purpose, and that's his purpose for us. Okay? What's our core problem? We're all sinners who we felt very sure of God's glory because we were prideful and we were, were resisting the authority of God. All took place back a long time ago. We talked about that many weeks ago. Number five, how is this problem resolved or how is it solved? It is solved because how? 
Because Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. My sins, and your sins, and for the sins of the whole world. And we can be a person that comes to him. And by loving him, he'll help us to love others. And number seven, what happens to me when I die? What happens to me when I die? There are so many different answers to this question that many people think they have, but there's only really one answer. We will either be with the Lord forever in heaven, or we will live apart from him in hell for eternity. God has a plan. He's had it for all of these years. All these years. It's been violated, and there's been consequences. It's been followed, and we've seen God's blessing and his joy demonstrated. Let me read what William Booth said, the founder of Salvation Army, that I'm done. <clears throat> Salvation, uh, yeah, William Booth, here it was, was once asked to reveal the secret of his success. And here's what he said. After some hesitation, tears came down his eyes and he said this, I will tell you the secret to my success with his humble spirit. <clears throat> God has had all there was of me. There have been men with greater brains than I have, men with greater opportunities. But from the day I got the poor of London on my heart and caught a vision of what Jesus could do with them, I made up my mind that God should have all of William Booth. So there was a man that was committed. And all these years later, he still has a very, very strong ministry because he understood of giving God everything and allowing God to flow through him.